Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Katz, and welcome to Tuesday's edition of WeRSC.com's Inside the Trojan Huddle, where we tell it like it is. Friends, Inside the Trojan Huddle is a game-like panel discussion that is posted Tuesdays in the offseason, twice regularly in the regular season. And the huddle features WeRSC columnists, staff writers, and historians. We start first with the pregame show, where we introduce our panel members for this edition of Inside the Trojan Huddle and then give you the latest USC football news. First, let's meet Tuesday's panelists, a WeRSC columnist who writes WeRSC.com's The Monday Morass, yay or nay, and Sunday Takeaways, in addition to regular season football and basketball practice reports. He also hosts his own uh, podcast show entitled Locked On USC. That's Mark Culkin. The chairman and CEO of WeRSC.com, a USC graduate, and former Department uh, of Justice Supervisor and a trial lawyer and a general counsel, counsel for two large companies, Bruce Bagney. And a weekly WeRC columnist who writes Fridays, the obvious and not so obvious, IMHO Sunday, and it is an active member of the Football Writers Association of America, your moderator and producer of Inside the Trojan Huddle, Greg Katz. Before we kick off this Tuesday edition of Inside the Trojan Huddle, here's a bit of the latest USC football news from the week. To the surprise of no one, on Monday's deadline file for the 2023 NFL Draft, USC wide receiver Jordan Addison made his intentions official by declaring for the NFL Draft. Uh, some me, anticipated sorry. good news along the offensive line front. Veteran center Justin Dietrich formally announced this past weekend on social media that he's returning to USC to be the 2023 <laughs> offensive center for the Trojans. They'll be replacing Brett Nealon. Good news on the offensive line front. And Luke Heward, who served as the interim inside receivers coach uh, his past season, following the passing of Dave Nickel, has been named by Lincoln Riley as the permanent inside receivers coach for 2023. On the transfer front, veteran receiver Kyle Ford has entered his name into the NCAA transfer portal. And the Trojans got a huge portal transfer last week when former Texas A&M defensive lineman Anthony Lucas, 6'5", 285, announced his transfer to USC. Lucas is a former 2022 five-star recruit out of Scottsdale, Arizona. It has three years of eligibility remaining. And former Washington State offensive tackle Jared Kingston, 6'5", 302, has announced from his social media site that he will play for the Trojans in 2023. Kingston, who played at Washington State the previous five season, seasons, selected the Trojans over Ohio State. And on a sad note from last week, former USC Heisman Trophy winning tailback and two-time unanimous All-America tailback Charles White passed away uh, last week at the age of 64 from cancer. More on the life and times of Charles White momentarily. Friends, we are SC's uh, Inside the Trojans Huddle. Greatly appreciates your viewer and listenership. And we encourage those of you watching on sites like YouTube to click on the red subscriber and like buttons. It's greatly valued and it's free. And a reminder, wrse.com is offering a subscription special up to uh, August 31st, 2023. Mm -hmm. You can get all of the WeRSC uh, premium content for just $29.99 or $9.99 per month. All right. We kick off the first half of Tuesday's edition of Inside the Tro uh, Trojan Huddle. Panel, we start off with this first half on a sad news of the passing of Heisman Trophy winning tailback Charles White, who is both a member of the College Football Hall of Fame and also on the all packed uh, 12 All-Century team. Panel, if you give us your memory and thoughts regarding the great Charles White, let's start off with our leadoff hitter, as always, Mark Culkin. Your thoughts on the passing of Charles White? Obviously, you know, pretty sad. Um <laughs> Charles White, you know, people talk about runners who, you know, play with a tenacity and, and and just people remember Walt. I don't know if people are old enough to remember Walter Payton, but Charles White was to me was a very similar running back to Walter Payton. Um, the, the, the way they ran the ball, similar style. Um, Charles White was all knees and elbows. Uh, I, I always remember that loose fitting jersey that he wore. And it seemed like it was, he was like a leaf in the wind. He was hard to tackle, but he ran hard. Um, 
he is what USC's third Heisman Trophy Heisman Trophy winner, and he was in the same backfield as Marcus Allen. And I believe he was also at school at the same time that Ricky Bell was there. So that was the lineage of tailback. Ricky Bell, Charles White, Marcus Allen. And for me, I guess the greatest memory that I, because that was really in my youth. I was what, 10, 11, 12, when Charles was doing his thing. But the Rose Bowl against Ohio State, you know, 240 yards. I and, and Greg and or Bruce, you guys can write off the stats, but I know that he's still the USC's all-time leading rusher with over 6,000 yards. Uh, but the memory that will stand out with me, and it, it's kind of bittersweet. I used to live in Long Beach, Belmont Shore area, and I was just walking, and Charles White was walking towards me the, the same, the opposite direction. I was like, oh my God, that's Charles White. <clears throat> and I just put up the victory sign, hey, you know, fight on. And I, he, he, he greeted everybody the same, fight on Trojan. And that's the memory I'm going to have. And I know he wasn't in the best of places at that time. Um, he, he had his challenges after his football career was over. So hopefully um, he was able to, you know, have a little bit of peace in his life before he passed away last week. But for me, you're, you're talking about a running back who you look at him wasn't the biggest guy, but uh, you you did not want to have to try and tackle him. You know, people think USC has problems tackling today. He would have ran for 400 yards against this USC defense. <laughs> I, I mean, that's the best way to, to, to say how hard he ran. And, and you just didn't want to meet him in the hole because he was going to win that battle. Yeah, that's a very good point. Very good point. Bruce Bagney, you're old enough to uh, have seen Charles there, uh, obviously. Uh, what are your thoughts and memories of Charles White? Well, I, I've met him a number of times. He came to a number of our tailgates back when uh, Pete was coaching. And I uh, really enjoyed being with him, talking to him. Um, he is one of the toughest guys pound for pound that ever played at SC. I think John Robinson said he's the toughest guy ever played there under him. Yes, he did. And he weighed like 181 or 185, yeah. something like that. But he had the incredible, his body fat was less than 1%. Think about that. What? And he wasn't a big weightlifter. He, he just, that was the way he was uh, genetically. And uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful player. The, the, one of the things, I, I won't go into elaborate too much, but Back in 1979, uh, I was uh, I was teaching law school then. I was teaching law school at LSU, and our Trojans came in to play uh, in Baton Rouge, and we were number one in the country. And uh, you know, Paul McDonald was a quarterback. Charles White was a tailback. Marcus at uh, fullback. On that team, by the way, I looked it up. We had 30. 36 of those guys made the NFL. And we had 12 first round picks. Crazy. Incredible, incredible talent. But I'll never forget the game. Uh, we were down, I think it was 12 3 going in the fourth quarter. And they just started giving the ball to Charles. And he, he I think he finished with like 185 yards, something like that. But it was just do total dominance. I mean, Paul McDonald threw a touchdown pass at the end but it was Charles White. And I'll never forget that. I mean, just the, the guts and the courage and the toughness. Um, it's a big loss. I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry to your point, Mark, that he had to struggle at the end of his life. Yeah, you know, I have a lot of memories of Charles White. I remember uh, seeing Charles White when he played at San Fernando. They were in the wishbone and uh, he was impossible to stop on one of the one of the option plays of the issue, wishbone the next time I, I saw him was uh in those days uh they had a media day before they actually officially started practice in august like the day before they would officially start and it was a day in those days where the media would come out and they would snap pictures of all those different stances you see players uh, individually in you know, linebackers getting ready to make a tackle or linemen in a three-point stance. And I remember Charles, uh, as did uh, his backfield at San Fernando, 
uh, they all had these wonderfully uh, uh, well done afros. And I remember seeing him and of course, he uh, this was new to him. So I remember him laying on his side like he's in bed, but he was against the wall, which was next to Goo Gate, as we know, the entrance to USC. And he had a look on his face like he was just one badass dude. Okay? <laughs> I mean, he looked like he was ready to take on anything that moved within five feet of him. And uh, he could give a, a, a mad dog stare with the best of them. But when I think of Charles White, I think of a couple of plays. Uh, I was watching the Ohio State drive the other night uh, on YouTube, and there was a play where he goes into the into the line, gets about three year, yards, and gets hit head on by an Ohio State linebacker, and it gets knocked about maybe uh, six yards, not six. I would say probably maybe he got knocked backwards. Yeah, and <laughs> it's like he it's like he gained regained his balance. And then kept on moving forward again. And that was tough. You know, Char, uh, John Robinson said of the quotes that he gave about uh, Charles White is that Charles White should have been a Navy SEAL. Yeah. And he, and he had no fear whatsoever. He has never coached a player. Uh, and he should know. He coached a lot of great ones in the backfield that had that type of no fear mentality. But the couple of plays that I remember about Charles White, the number one plays, they went down to Alabama. And they uh, they they pretty much beat up a good Alabama team that ended up, uh, and I still scratch my head on this, as co-national champions. Yeah, I remember that. And, and Charles White took a took a sweep around the right side, and he just went around and through and reverse direction, and he scored this touchdown. And I said, "My God, is he good?" Now he did have a great offensive line, not good, great. He had like Buddy and Foster and all the other ones. I mean, they, he, it was the perfect uh, combination, right? And then I remember, you know, Charles White in the Rose Bowl. Uh, I think it was Ricky Bell had got knocked out of the game. Uh, and he, he stepped in and, you know, it was like nothing bothered him. He might as well have been a senior. But which, which kind of leads me to the next question, guys, uh, that I've added on. In your opinion, where does Charles White rank in the USC heritage of, of tailback legends? Is he the best ever? Is he one of the best ever? Uh, how do you, how do you see it, Mark? Uh, well, before I do that, you know, you brought up the San Fernando team, and last week on my Locked On USC uh, podcast, someone reminded me that Charles White on that San Fernando team, it wasn't just him; it was Kevin Williams, who also was a Trojan. And uh, Manfred I Moore. I remember his first name, but the last name was Moore. Manfred Moore. Him. Who? Manfred Moore. There you go. There's a there's a magazine. Man, let, me ask, let, me, let me just for point of information. Is it was it Manfred or Kenny Moore? They were both was on the team. Was was I it think. both? Okay. I think so. I I, I keep thinking anyway, Kenny. Anyway, there's a prep magazine with their afros in full regalia. Yeah. Do a Google <laughs> yeah, search. Yeah. The three of them on the cover of the magazine. So pretty cool. To your question, though, Greg, um, wow. For me, obviously, Reggie Bush did things that none of the other USC tailbacks were able to do. I mean, I, I know you love O.J. Simpson and what he was capable of. Um, Marcus Allen, Charles White. We just saw what Caleb Williams did at, at quarterback. But when you think about Charles White, just because of his toughness. Um, like I said, you said it, he's not the biggest guy, but you just didn't want to tackle him. He played the position like he was Earl Campbell. Um, like if they had tearaway jerseys, his would have came off many, many, many times. <laughs> so maybe it's a sentimental pick right now because he just passed away, but Charles is up there. You know, it's interesting that you say what you said, Mark. You know, Gary Paskowitz, our late great publisher, uh, always told me that he, first of all, he thought Charles White was the greatest running back that he had ever seen, okay, because he saw him in person just like yourself. But he was also uh, Gary's favorite USC football player, and he never backed down from that. Reggie Bush, all of them, that was it for him. Bruce, what 
What? How did you see it? Because I know you saw Simpson play. Yeah. Well, play well, you know, you know, I here, here's the way I, I see it. it. You know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, it's comparing, you know, Mozart and Beethoven. You know, I mean, we're talking about incredible excellence. Um, my, but to me, the greatest running back ever was OJ Simpson. Um, and, uh, he did things that were unbelievable. He ran a nine, 200 and had great power and speed, but right there with him in my mind is, is Charlie white. Uh, it's probably a, a tie. And then I go down from there, you know, uh, Marcus was great. Certainly Reggie was great, but. I'd have those guys at the top. Yeah, you know, uh, I will say this about Charles White, uh, because I had the good fortune of seeing all of them uh, in person for a long time. Uh, Charles was as tough as any of them. He ranked oh, yeah. right there with Simpson. And, oh, yeah. But the thing about Simpson was that he was 6'2", anywhere between 207 and 210 ran the incredibly low, uh, you know, 100s and 9.3, 9.2, whatever. Yeah. I think it was 9.3, actually. Yeah, but, that's when they ran the 100-yard dash. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly, exactly. And to me, Simpson did it in two years as a transfer from City College of, of, of San Francisco. The others did it. I think Charles played four years at USC. He played four years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's, I mean, what Simpson did, and he did not have a great, well, he had a couple of superstar offensive linemen during his junior year in Ron Yeri, of course, and the other tackle was Mike Taylor. They both went to the NFL. Yeri, of course, went in the Hall of Fame. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to take anything away from Charles White. I mean, he he was a stud. He deserves to be in that conversation. And I could see, uh, you know, I would hate to say something about a player that I had not seen in person. Uh, and that's why I always respected, uh, you know, Gary Paskowitz's comment is he's the best I've ever seen. Yeah. And he did say to me one time, he says, I would have, I really would have loved to have seen Simpson. Uh, you know, and Essie's had so many great running backs, but Charles definitely, I think his statistics speak for itself. All right, we're going to transition. Uh, here. Hey, uh, hey, Greg, one last thing. Yeah, sure. You know, there are two other guys that <clears throat> don't get the, they, they don't get the coverage. Both were shafted out of the uh, Heisman Trophy. One was Ricky Bell, and yeah, the other one was A.D., Anthony Davis. Anthony yeah. Davis also went to San Fernando. He was older, but he had that same toughness. Anthony Davis was about 185, just a really tough guy, great player. So, you know, it's, again, it's, it's awfully hard to compare. We, we, we've had a plethora uh, of, of wonderful, wonderful tailbacks. and. Um, I, I, I'm really sorry that, that Charlie White ended up the way he did because uh, uh, I think he was a good man. And uh, like a lot of guys, they just end up getting down the wrong path and it's an it in tragedy, unfortunately. Yes, it does. All right, let's transition a little bit here. After listening or reading the quotes of Lincoln Riley's two-hour press conference last week, do you think that he has maintained his aura of, of credibility, or you, do you think his credibility has taken a hit? And we should say this in fairness, Mark was at the meeting representing wersc.com. I read the quotes. Uh, uh, you know, Bruce, I'm sure you, you saw some yeah, of it. I, I've read, uh, I've read the, I read the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's start off uh, uh, as, as we do in the pattern here with Mark and, and especially uh, accurate because Mark was there. It's a lot. It's easier to read words, but it's it's not really the same as seeing it in person with the way they were uh, pronounced, the, the nonverbal signs. Mark, has Lincoln Riley maintained his credibility after you were at that press conference, or do you think his credibility has taken a hit by some of the things he said? So, anybody who's ever watched any of the Star Trek, you know how that you know defense shields have been damaged. His defense shields have been damaged by 2%. So at 100%, he's down down to 98% credibility, um, which is pretty damn high. The only thing that was higher than that 98% was USC's probability of winning against Tulane in the Cotton Bowl. But we all know how that ended up. Yes, we do. Now, with that said, um, 
I am very comfortable with how Lincoln Riley answered the questions that we threw at him. Uh, I like to, you know, kind of read how people are, are answering the questions. And I think that's what you were getting at, Greg. So I, I believe everything that he says, I believe that he believes everything he says. And that's what's most important is that he has his convictions and he believes in it. So if you're going to try and sell something, you better have a passion about it. Uh, so on that, um, yeah, he's still very credible. I, I know we're going to kind of peel back the layers a little bit on the next question. So that's why I'm kind of leaving it there. Fair enough. Bruce, what did you think? Is, has his credibility been damaged by what he said? Well, uh, well, you know, uh, th there's always a lot of coach speak, you know, and these coaches, they do coach speak. I thought it was pretty direct, though, for the most part. Um, I, I thought he was addressing the, the issues. I didn't like the answers necessarily in all <laughs> cases, especially about Grinch. But uh, I look, it, it's all on him now. It's all on him. You know, he's, he's, he has chosen this path. He's retaining this coaching staff in, in entirety, as far as we know. And it's up to him now. Let's see what he can do next year. Well, I'll tell you, I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. Uh, partially because I agree with Mark. There has been a hit. How substantial the hit is, I don't really think we know. But we'll definitely know one year from from now, because if Grinch doesn't or falls on his face, let's say that, or SC doesn't win the conference, which is possible because it's going to be a lot better conference next year with all the great quarterbacks coming back, and of course SC now having to play Oregon and Washington, Oregon at Eugene, the chances are really more challenging. But that means they're more challenging also for Grinch. I mean, he's going to face. Uh, you know, two quarterbacks in in Bo Nix and uh, Michael Penix that can really create some havoc if they're healthy. Um, I and think Cameron was, Rising. What's that? And Cameron Rising. And Cameron, absolutely. Cameron Who's, Rising. Don't mention his out. name again. Please You're do gonna not. You're going to see him for a third time, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> he gets an automatic We Are SC decal for coming back three times. Uh, there's a couple of comments that he made that I said, okay, buddy, I know you're financially stable now. You're making what, $110 million for 10 years. You live in a big $17.5 million home. Good for you. You deserve it. You got it. But then he started making, and again, I was not there to see the facial comments like uh, Mark was. So it's, a, it's an entirely different feeling. But just as a person who's, let's just say, I wasn't, in with wrse.com since 2001 uh and i was just reading it where he says he's going to take more uh he's going to give more attention to the defense well that kind hallelujah. of hallelujah yeah, yeah hallelujah but also it's a it's a it's a concern for me not a red flag it's a yellow flag because i go you should have been paying attention to your defense hey you know what well, yes sir you took a page right out of Pete carroll's book he gave Norm Chow his first year to run the offense his way. The next year, Pete Carroll got more involved, and the team took off. So maybe, maybe Lincoln Riley read Pete Carroll's memoirs. Well, I, I hope so. If he if he learned something from it, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm all for that. But let's remember that I Pete put it in that context is where I'm going. Okay. Well, no, I I see where you're coming from. Uh, but I'm concerned about it because he also said, I like the direction the defense is going. Yeah, I didn't now, like that. I didn't like that. Okay. Now, maybe he's referring that he knows where they're going because he knew at the time of this media conference, and correct me if I'm wrong, that he knew that uh, or was pretty sure that <laughs> Anthony Lucas was going to transfer to USC, that he had the kid from Purdue coming over. Uh, and he already had uh, bars coming over from Arizona. So he already said, I like we're going in the direction of it. 
it reminded me of when Clay Helton would say, yeah. you know, I, I'm getting more involved in running the offense now. Yeah. And I think you're right on the, the cusp of turning the corner, knowing full well that he says this in the middle or late October. And when you look at the the, the November schedule, they're playing all the, the dregs of the Pac-12 conference. So the chances of him winning are great. And of course, when they do, then he says, I felt it was coming. It was just a matter of time. And we finally have turned a corner. And I go, you turned a corner because you played a, a inferior teams. That's how you turn the corner. And by the same token, I will say this, and I'll debate anyone to, to the mat, that, you know, SC did not play a particularly difficult schedule. Not that it wasn't challenging. You got to give them the, all the credit in the world for, for beating UCLA and Notre Dame. You know, hats off to them. Standing ovation. However, when they faced Utah twice, they lost uh, because they were a much better team than who of the other teams that they beat. And they beat a Notre Dame team, which was, you know, you could come to your own conclusions, the quarterback transfers to Arizona State, uh, Pine. So, you know, we'll see how that goes in South Bend uh, <laughs> with, with a new quarterback from Wake, Wake Forest, who's not bad. But I, I said to myself, look, when they had their, their biggest challenges, even Tulane, uh, in fact, I was talking with our with our esteemed colleague, uh, Kevin Bruce, who was thoroughly disgusted with what the defense did against Tulane. He, 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 I mean, he just uh, he was in form uh, talking about what what the mistakes that he felt that uh, Alex Grinch was making. And he certainly defined it for me. But to me, when you make comments. You have to be very measured uh, so that they don't come back to bite you. And I, I'm really hoping that everything that 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 Lincoln Riley said will come true. I think there was also the pressure of uh, knowing that next year is the last uh, go round in all probability for Caleb Williams, and he wasn't going to do anything to rock the boat for Caleb Williams and say, "I'm sorry, you know, we're going to start our defense all over," which would have, you know, maybe that was a good reason not to have people because he knew that he was getting these transfers, uh, you know, the, the kid from a linebacker from Oklahoma state. So good for him. All right, let me, uh, let's move on here. Uh, panel, what specifically did you like hearing or reading from Lincoln Riley state of the program, uh, media conference last week in which among other things, he announced the return of his entire coaching staff, Mark, your thoughts. Well, you touched on the very end of your, your, uh, soliloquy there. Um, the, the, the continuity, I, I like that. And, you know, you're talking about why he didn't want to maybe change defensive coordinator to upset, you know, the apple cart with Caleb Williams. Um, I don't think that would have upset Caleb, but I understand your point. And I think that's where Lincoln was going with that. The continuity. Um, when he said, you know, the, the idea for us to have the continuity, just us together, us with our players, us in the setting, the, the school kind of knowing what we want to build is important. Um, you have to have you have to feel that you have the right people in the building, people that have great clarity on what we need to do, and have the capabilities and the experience to continue to make this thing go that direction. And I fully believe that we have that, and I have really no reservations at all saying that. So I love that. I, I you know anybody who's coached. Um, continuity is very important. It's worked out for Georgia. Um, they've allowed Kirby Smart to build it his way. He's maintained his coaching staff with some continuity, and look what they've done. They've they've caught Alabama, and they're on. They're basically passing him right now in in, in the third turn. What you? I, I guess what was a little um, contradictory contradictory for me was not. Much later, when you know he, he had said that he decided to bring Alex Grinch back, was he wasn't doing it based on an emotional response off of one year. Well, we know he's had multiple years to evaluate Alex Grinch. So, yes, he's bringing in more better players, and he he truly believes that this defense will work with better talent than what he had to use this past season. Well, as you said, he's made the decision. There's no more fingers to point. There's no more excuses to make. If USC isn't able to match and get to the conference championship game and beyond, there's 
when you're doing this, there's a, there's three more fingers pointing in your direction. So again, and I appreciate the fact that Lincoln Riley is taking on the full responsibility. So he gave his rationale. He explained why he's doing it. You either, you don't have to like it, but you do have to accept it and it's time to move on. That's why what I wrote on Sunday, Lincoln Riley can be really eloquent and give some great detailed responses, but in the end, at the very end, it's so what, now what? And we know yeah. who said that. Yeah. Ruth, what, what, did, what, did you, what did you think? What did you like? That you heard in in some of the announcements that uh, that Riley said. Well, the thing that I <clears throat> liked the best was that uh, they needed to improve the defensive line, and it seems to me, by all accounts, that's exactly what they're doing. We just you mentioned some of them a little while ago, uh, Greg. So I like that a lot. That's clearly was was a, a weakness of the team. Uh, so I like that. I. There's a lot of coach speak. Um, uh, I, I and it's it kind of melds, kind of flows into the next question. But yeah, that's why I kind of. <laughs> you know, I don't like it when coaches blame the players. I'm sorry. Uh, and that's what it, that's what he did. He said we didn't we played bad defense because we didn't have the personnel. Well, okay, we'll get into that in a second, but. That really is a turnoff to me because e even though you may not have all the five-star guys, we had enough good athletes in that team that if Grinch were really a good defensive coach, he would have found a way to make it happen, to improve it somehow. As it was, it was absolutely abysmal. I'm sorry oh, I jumped in. No, 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 not, not a problem. Uh, what I liked about uh, what, what Riley did was he – Besides taking accountability, which he should, that's what he's paid to do. Uh, you know, he seemed to um, uh, acknowledge what we all know. So it's always nice to know that he thought this was pretty bad on the defensive end. And it goes back to uh, kind of something that Mark said, kind of, okay, now what? Okay, you know what the problem is? Fix it. I think he had, I think this year was a get out of jail free card for him. That, you know, okay, you said what you're going to do. Now let's see if you go do it, which leads to the next question of what specifically did you not like hearing or reading from Lincoln Riley's media conference last week? So, Mark, have at it. Um, where I didn't like, I did like it because we've been so used to, you know, I, the, the molly coddling, not not throwing the players under the bus publicly, so to speak, um, being mindful of feelings. I like the fact that Lincoln Riley doesn't care if feelings get hurt with what he says. Um, now, at the same time, he, uh, he might be putting too much of the responsibility or the blame on the players. And that's what I don't like. And it's just that, that fine line that you have to walk. Um, when he said, for instance, when he says, you can't fake the front seven, he's absolutely 100% correct. USC's front seven did not look like a front seven that you need. It didn't look like Georgia's. And that's who he uses the example when he said, look at the guys. He said, do they look like our guys? Not yet. Our guys don't look like that. They will soon. Um, well, you had a year to get them, you know, bulk up. And they did get bigger and they, you know, the, the strength and conditioning program was working or, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a work in motion. You know, it, it hasn't stopped and never stops. And that's what they're doing now. He made a point of saying that between now and spring camp opening, you know, it's not about getting out there and throwing the ball and all that. We're, we're going to be focusing on the weight room and running, getting bigger, faster nutrition, yada, yada, yada. Um, I'm not a huge fan uh, putting the responsibility on the players when your scheme is getting um, questioned. Yeah. Like saying that, you know, we tell the players, don't make it 50 50 on us to make the decision because some of the time we're going to be right, some of the time we're going to be wrong. And I think he was using the Ray John Davis um, as the example. You didn't have to wait until the end of the year when, for the last four or five weeks of the season, 
you and the coaching staff were saying, yeah, you know, he's right on the cusp. He's been practicing great. But then he would never get into the game. And then when he does get into the game, he makes some plays. Um, and again, just to kind of put a final nail, hammer to the nail on this one, when he's breaking down why USC lost. You know, if we didn't have a hold on the kickoff in the first game against Utah, we're probably in the playoffs. He gets a little bit analytical where he starts getting specific about certain plays and how they've been executed better. Um, whether that's on the coaching staff or on the players, whatever. Um, I don't know. It, it's, I like it, but I don't. It's, it, you have to balance it. And I think there's times where Lincoln can maybe get a little defensive and he'll start pointing out certain things, how had this been done differently on the field? I'm still allowed to use that word, by the way. Um, things might have been different. What do you think, Bruce? Uh, well, well I, not like I've hearing already, or reading from Lincoln Riley's media well, conference. Yeah, I, I've already stated what I said about <clears throat> blaming the players, but I also didn't hear one word from him about the special teams. And oh, the special teams were they were a disaster. Let's, they were terrible. I mean, with the talent we have, we ought to be returning punts and kickoffs at least beyond the twenty yard line. So that was disappointing to me. Uh, so yeah, that that and uh, let's, he, he let's did mention special, he did mention special teams, but it was it, it was it was in direct correlation to not having the 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 depth the underbelly talent of depth on the defense, and that carried over to special teams. Okay, well I'm not buying that, but anyway, I hear you. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know. I was a little bit disappointed, but I understand why he did it with the special teams. I mean, it's you don't have a lot of defense of the special teams. I'm sorry. No. Uh, and I, I agree with Mark on this particular thing about uh, you can't blame the players for everything. Let's just use uh, Mario Williams. He muffs the kickoff, right? Well, why was he back there in the first place? Yeah. Had he been back there the entire season? This was the biggest spotlight on the biggest stage on national television. And he got caught up in the bright lights, I think. And it, the concentration of kick, catching a ball in front of a big stadium, uh, it got to him. Okay. But again, uh, if you got a, if I use a baseball analogy, if you got a guy that can't hit a fastball, why are you putting him up in the bottom of the ninth inning, you know, three and, you know, uh, you know, with a runner on third, wh why are you even putting him in that position to do what he's been doing, you know, striking out most of the season? Uh, I didn't un understand that. And I will say this, and I, again, I, I know it sounds like, okay, here we go again, but having been a coach and having been on successful programs, okay, both in football and in basketball, although the sports are different, it still gets down to matching scheme with players. Yep. I'm smart enough to know when I was at Edison uh, in football, we won the CIF twice in a row at the large school division, the highest level. And I remember what was being taught and was being coached offensively, defensively, the whole thing. And I saw whether the players took that onto the field. So where could you hold a, a player accountable if you saw what happened? I know in basketball, uh, one of the things I did when I was uh, in charge of it, I would invite parents, why don't you come into practice? I'll give you a chair. You sit down and you watch your son practice. You listen to everything that I'm teaching. And then when you go to the games on Friday night or Wednesday night, see if your child is doing what you saw they're supposed to do rather than sit there and say, well, the coach is calling the wrong plays. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm calling the right plays but your son isn't doing what he was taught, right? <laughs> so to me, that was a big thing. I'm going to say, you want to criticize me? Have at it. But you better see what I'm teaching and what I'm coaching and the emphasis I'm putting on it. Uh, I asked Kevin Bruce uh, to, earlier today, uh, is the problem with defense that they just can't tackle? Or is the problem the, the, the scheme of uh, the idea that I am trying to strip the ball? And he said to me something that I totally believed in already, but he said, 
and he was he should know he was a team captain of a national championship team right uh in the sense that look the first thing to do is you got to strike the player with the ball and then let the next guy come in and try to take it take it out that is correct that is correct. you know and i said are do you think kevin especially after watching the tulane game uh did it appear to you that the emphasis of getting a ball carrier is was not as big as the emphasis of getting a turnover first. And he said, no, they got to bring a guy to the ground. They got to punish him with the hit and then we'll go and try to strip the ball. So that to me, and because we can't go to practice and Mark can verify this, you don't know what they're teaching. You don't see what the emphasis, they might entirely be saying tackle him first and then strip it. But we don't know that. We can't verify that. You can't have a backstory saying, but this is what they've been teaching. The players just aren't doing it. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not for one for throwing a player, especially at the college level, under the bus uh, because they're uh, technically not getting paid a salary per se. Uh, but I do think that if you have a little background knowledge on what's being done, the media can help you. In, in in verifying that you are teaching things the, wrong, the right way the players aren't doing it the right way so you know it, it's a it's a thing that you have to know like if you got uh players that let's say are just use basketball as an example if you got players that can't shoot from the outside why are you going to keep telling them to shoot from the outside you better figure out how to get the ball inside into the key and pick up fouls and and so on and so forth so that you can make it more to your advantage. You know, like I used to say, I don't need a six, seven guy shooting a three who's supposed to rebound for him, a five, five, nine guard. Uh, you know, it's about philosophy scheme. So, you know, I think Lincoln Riley, uh, you know, is going to do coach speak. I think he's done it, but in the long run, bottom line to me is everything you said, let's see, let's see the change. And maybe he's got it all right. Maybe he definitely got a hand on it. But we're going to find out. So with that, I'm done with my soliloquy, as Mark would say. <laughs> and I, I I appreciate Mark using that term, uh, soliloquy. I mean, I, I felt, appreciate I, I felt like Abraham Lincoln for a moment. Uh, all right. Well, soliloquies right out of Shakespeare. Oh, thank you, William. Stratford yeah, all the way. Yeah, William's, William's taking care of you. <laughs> I call him Bill, Bill for short. Yes, <laughs> Bill for short. Well, That's yeah. right. All right, guys, it's halftime, and here's our question. I, at first, I thought of it, well, is this really controversial? But it actually, the more I kept reading about it and seeing it, the more I kept saying, you know what? Is this a crack in the dike on this idea of USC uh, being called Southern Cal? So last week, the USC women's basketball team unveiled a new uniform that had the name Southern Cal on the front of the jersey. Do you think that this is a harringer of things to come, like football? Your thoughts on the Southern Cal reference to USC in general, Mark? What do you think? I first of all, I was like, why are the women only the team wearing this jersey? The men need to have that jersey as well. I need to see that stuff back in the bookstore. I, I know Mike Garrett wasn't a fan of the Southern Cal um, name. Everyone thought it was, you know an extension of the cow, bring it back. I, I love it. T. Jackson used to call USC Southern Cal. Bring it back. I love it. I don't want to see it on the football uniform in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll tell you what. If I'm going to be flexible and they want to do something different, put on the helmet. Give us one game with a Southern Cal helmet. That's it, though. But as far as the whole script, yeah, I loved it. So you would like to see it on the men's basketball jersey? Absolutely. Tomorrow. In fact, have it ready for the game against UCLA on the 26th. I expect to see, now mark my words, Bruce Bagney. I expect <laughs> to see Mark wearing a Southern Cal jersey at one of our soonest uh, huddles. I don't know okay. if I'll wear, wear a jersey, but if they got the sweatshirt, you know, something, T-shirt, I'm all on. I will be. He's going to have it. Okay. Okay. Well, so what do you, so so what do you think, Bruce? Are you in well, well, the Southern Cal? Get all worked up, you know what? Here's the deal. I, I I do remember Keith Jackson, Southern Cal, Southern California, but back here in the uh, whatever this is here, back here, 
Uh, well, let's clarify why that because Bruce <laughs> lives in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. SEC. So he, country. He's going to know what the reference. Uh, but they all, listen. Everybody refers to us as Southern Cal here. That's what they do, and you know what? I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, 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 I'm uh, like with Mark, and and furthermore, I don't want anybody confusing us with South Carolina. And uh, uh, Southern Cal doesn't sound like South Carolina to me. No. So I'm fine. I, I don't, people get worked up. About, I don't know why people are worked up about it. I don't care. But, but actually, were... I think I, I, I like the idea that we're known as Southern Cal. Wow. I mean, here, I mean, we're, we're you know, we're, we're legendary in a lot of ways. I've never heard, heard very few people refer to us as SC or USC. It's always Southern Cal. So someone, so someone's going to so figure be. out the dollar signs and, and, and start profiting off this again. You bet. You bet. They will. They will. Well, I, I tell you, I, the first time I actually heard the term Southern Cal was back in the 60s when I used to watch Notre Dame replay highlights with Lindsey Nelson and Paul Horning. Oh, and yeah. I, I remember they, they came on from the Coliseum and they said, Southern Cal is the number one team in the country and Southern Cal and Paul Horning is going Southern Cal. And I go, who calls them Southern Cal, right? Yeah. And, and, and uh, then when I went to the back to the Midwest a couple of times, they'd always say, you know, uh, especially on Notre Dame's campus. Well, you know, Southern Cal is this and Southern Cal is that. And it never bothered me. I think the thing that was stupid, in my opinion, was when they put it in the uh in the media guide, we we don't we don't refer to ourselves as Southern Cal. What the hell is that about? Who right, I, I kept saying, why is this in the media guide? You know, first of all, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with the way the uniforms look today, right? For football, yeah, uh, I'm a little a little annoyed. I know what they're doing. I understand why they're on the helmets. It's starting to look like a NASCAR with yeah, uh, NASCAR, all the stuff yeah. that's on there. Uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't offensive when they first put on the Spartan logo on the sides of the helmet, right? Because during McKay's years, they didn't have that on the side. Sometimes they would have the number actually on the side of the helmet. But uh, now I see there's fight on in the front of it and there's stuff in yeah, the that, yeah. it. You know, you got the Pac-12 logo. You got all these things. To me, you know what? Enough is enough. But I think it's okay to call them Southern Cal. I just don't want to see it uh, on, uh, on on football uniforms. I remember back in the days when I would go to the LA Sports Arena with my uncle to watch USC basketball, and you know there was time it said tr the, the basketball uniforms in the '60s were really nice. They were really good. Uh, even in the late '60s, they were really good. And I think sometimes I and I got to be I got to check to make sure I'm saying what I'm saying is right. I think he used to say Southern California on there. Yeah, they actually brought that uniform back. Um, they, they've worn, the men have worn that uniform recently, so to speak, over the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I, I will be the first to admit, I haven't gone to uh, US. I think the last time I went, I went to see a USC UCLA game at the, uh, the old Staples Center uh, just because I wanted to see, watch the game. Uh, but to me, uh, the basketball uniforms were really quite good with Southern California on there. Southern Cal, that would that would that wouldn't bother me. I tell you what bothers me is not the Southern Cal reference; is when they take colors outside of Cardinal and Gold. That really bothers me. Well, let me let me just tell you my biggest peeve of all those. Please, okay, call me call us Southern Cal all you want. You wear white socks and black shoes. I mean. That's that was the the uniform. Now they wear all different kinds of colors of socks, and they you know the 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 jerseys underneath. And I mean, it's kind of a mix and match, a mismatch, uh, uh, you know, a potpourri, if you will. And I'd like us just to have a uniform. A uniform means everybody is uniform. Everybody hey, wears the uniform, and uh, I would enforce that if I were the coach, but I'm not the coach. Well, I'm going to ask, I'm going to, I'm putting Mark Culkin on the spot on this one, because I know how passionate he is. What do you think about the USC football players when they come out and they're, and they're not wearing the same socks or shoe color or whatever? Does that bother you or does it not bother you? 
it, it will bother me if I start saying the team losing their losing that culture that, that Lincoln Riley has definitely changed what was going on before when the team shows up and they come down the pair style off the bus, everybody's got on their own fashionable attire. Yeah. I'll go with that. that. That's individuality. When they start coming out of the tunnel yeah. and getting ready for warmups, they all are wearing the same gear, so to speak. So um, I'm in that boat. You're let, there's a time to be an individual, but, but when it's your time to put on the uniform, yeah, I think everybody should look the same. I'm not about guys coming in, some guys with no shirts, some guys with shirts. Yeah, I'm, a, yeah. I'm about uniform. It's, yeah. it's discipline. That little bit, yeah, of course it's, it's about true. discipline. And that type of stuff lends credibility to it. Yeah. Yeah. Young people actually like discipline. They just don't know it. <laughs> but but listen, listen, guys, I was in the army, okay? And there's a reason why everybody wears the same uniform. It's just what you said, Mark. It's discipline and building the team and, you know, all for one and one for all. That's the notion. We don't have outliers. We don't have guys coming in wearing, you know, pink fatigues. Everybody wears the same uniform. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. I, I like that consistency, but I'm probably old school. All right, let's move on. Second half kickoff. Here we go. Panel, already there are 2023 very early preseason polls. And one of those polls, ESPN, has the Trojans pre-ranked number seven in the country for next season. The highest ranked team in the Pac-12. Are the Trojans too high or too low? And give us your rationale. Are they even a top 10 team going into next season? Uh, we'll start off with Bruce Bagney. Your thoughts? It, 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 uh, look, it, they, it may be the right ranking, but it's based on a huge assumption. And that is, and we talked about this last week, that the defense, we've, we've all agreed that if the defense improves 50%, we've got a shot at winning the national title with Caleb and the offense we have. So this is all contingent to me on how much we improve defensively. If we, if we don't, we're, we're, it, it's too high and uh, we'll have to see, but I, you know, it's a, it's a guessing game at this point. I think they've made the right moves, bringing in some of these big linemen. And uh, I mean, we've got a couple of great linebackers, three or four guys coming in who are really solid on defense. So maybe it'll happen, but I don't know. It's kind of, to me, it's a, uh, it's a guessing game at this point. Mark, what do you have on paper? Are they a top 10 team? Are they number four in the country, seven in the country, 10 in the country? What are they? On January 16th, 2023, they have the best player in college football returning. That's so uh, being ranked number seven right now, I could not care any less. Yeah. Um, you. Because their roster is going to, it's still fluid, it's still changing. Um, yeah, they're, they're right where they should be. Nobody needs to tell anybody. Nobody needs to tell Lincoln Riley. Nobody tell, needs to tell anybody in that locker room or tell you, me, Bruce, USC's defense needs to get better. That's the duh. Look at that big red truck that went by. Oh, yeah, that's called a fire truck. Number seven right now is fine because, like you said, offensively, they're going to be fine. Everyone knows where they need to get better. They can't get any worse. uh yeah well i will say this i i i err on the side of caution okay and i agree that roster is not done changing just let's see what happens at the end of the transfer portal window which will be closing shortly actually let's i would go to the second transfer portal exactly and that was that's where i was transitioning to let's see what happens after spring ball uh, and let's see what players are leaving, what players are available to come to USC. Plus, as Mark said, the fire engine example, uh, you know, the defense, but also the offense too. I'm, I, I, I'm not totally out of my mind concerned about the offensive line, but it's still going to be a new offensive line that's going to have to learn new things 
And it's not really where they are at the start of the season. It's where they are at the end of the season. But they're going to, like I said, they're going to have a tougher schedule. So where they are pre-ranked is always a nice, it's good for the marketing department. Let's put it that way. You know, and having Caleb Williams is good for the marketing department as well. But uh, I personally, right now, if you said uh, cats pick pick them where you think they should be, I, I would put them at number 10 to begin with because of the questions that we uh, have about them. Uh, and I don't think there's anything embarrassing or wrong with that. So let's go on to uh, the next uh, item here. Uh, with former quality wide receivers, C.J. Williams, Gary Bryant Jr., and Kyle Ford all hitting the transfer portal, your reaction and how will this affect the wide receiver core in 2023, Bruce Bagby? Um, we have a abundance of, of, of quality receivers. Uh, I was especially sorry to, to see Kyle Ford go. I really like him. I don't think they ever used him right. I think he's got a lot of ability, but you know, I was looking at the at the if you look at the returning receivers, Brennan Rice, Mario Williams, Michael Jackson, Kyron Hudson, we didn't see much of him, Taj Washington, and you indicated how much he's improved. Then the incoming guys, Zachariah Branch, Makai Lemon, this guy Jacoby Lane's about six foot five. I think he's, he's not coming. Own. He's not coming. Don't worry about him. He isn't coming. No, he's probably not going to get here. Okay, okay. Sorry to interrupt you, but go ahead. Okay, that's okay. Okay, but then uh, you know Dorian Singer. You you put those, and then who knows? Maybe Mar Marvin Harrison Jr. We talked about him last week, but I think we've got an abundance of wide receivers. Frankly, they, we probably should beef up a little bit on the tight end position, uh, especially if we're going to use them. But I, I'm not that worried about these losses. That's my bottom line. <laughs> Mark, what's your bottom line? You know, it, what's so funny about this, it, we could put the name Brew McCoy into that group right there yeah, that have go. left. Yeah. That's a starting wide receiver group at any school across the country. And the fact that these guys are leaving as bittersweet as it might be, USC's production is not going to be affected in the least because of the players they have coming back. And even with the loss of Jordan Addison declaring, you know, when we're taping the show today, he's going to the NFL. So um, the only concern is if players get injured, if this is your group, maybe depth becomes an issue down the line. But, you know, you're losing Gary Bryant and Kyle Ford and CJ Williams, you know, obviously he, he had a few catches as during his freshman year, but, Gary didn't play at all in 2022 and Kyle Ford, as much as he came on in the end, um, he needs what he's battled through. He needs to be the focal point wide receiver. You're not going to be a focal point, focal point wide receiver with what USC has. That's not a knock on Kyle. That just says Caleb has way too many tools to use um, to have a primary wide receiver. So, um, I'm not concerned at all. It doesn't, I, this doesn't affect USC. You hope that they all go on and have great careers elsewhere, but you're replacing them with maybe better players. I mean, you, we've heard Chris Arledge. He cannot wait to see Zach Branch get the ball in his hands. Well, I can't either. Film on this guy is unbelievable. It, correct. So USC is going to be fine at wide receiver. Yeah, I agree. Think about those players that are leaving. Those are starters pretty much. I would say 90% of the programs across the country. Absolutely. And USC is barely blinking. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's not going to, they're not going to miss a beat. Um, I looked at each receiver and said, why would, why would I leave if I was him? Uh, Kyle Ford was easy. He already had his degree. Okay. And to me, that's the first thing I look at is the educational standpoint do you have your degree from USC? Uh, I think Ford wants to be able to showcase for the NFL that he's, that he could play at that level and stay healthy. So I understood that. I think CJ Williams probably, I, I know this is going to sound bad. I think he doubted his own ability, uh, which I think he is considerable. 
to compete against a large group of people that have considerable ability as well. And he says, you know what? I don't want to get lost in the shuffle. Uh, I want to go someplace like he did, Wisconsin. And Gary Bryant Jr., I think he never uh, was able to make himself feel comfortable uh, in that room, not as a personality and getting along with the team or anything, but the idea of where was where where do I his feel? role his role exactly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I understood why they left. Uh, you know, Singer's a big addition from Arizona. You know, I it's going to be interesting to see how it all shakes out. But the last position I'm worried about is depth at wide receiver. Yeah, they've got it. They've got it coming out of their ears, so to speak. Absolutely. And since we are talking about people coming and going, uh, let's go and talk about the first transfer uh, window we know is is closing. Uh, as we look towards 2023, uh, what were your concerns on offense and defense that appear to either have been alleviated <coughs> or remain an issue? Bruce, what what do you where do you feel good about the transfer portal in, uh, on offense and defense? Did it on both in on on both lines, offense yeah. and defense, uh, and uh, I think we made some considerable progress there. Uh, you know, the getting the getting the kid from uh, from Florida, the big left tackle. And by the way, you know who his girlfriend is? Okay, I, I can't give the answer because. You already told me, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bow out. Okay, of you know who it is, Mark? Yeah, he's he's got Tony Vaselli's daughter as a fiance. There you go, there you go. It's Tony's daughter. <laughs> uh, but when, if you look at the people they're adding on the defensive line and the offensive line, I think they've made some real progress. And incidentally, of course, and then you, like, I don't know that we needed him, but I mean, getting Singer wide out. And the running back from South Carolina, uh, uh, I saw Marshawn some film. Lloyd. What's his name? Marshawn Lloyd. Lloyd. Yeah, Mar he is a tough little guy, but 5'9", 210 or something like that. Powerful runner. So I, I'm actually pretty pleased with what we've done with the portal. Mark, your assessment? Yeah, you know, one of the, another thing that I really enjoyed what Lincoln Riley said, and he's he's following through with it, um, they, he said that they were going to address that front seven, and they've yeah. attacked that issue through the portal very aggressively. And again, they're not done. They're going to see what happens at other spring camps, and when that transfer window opens up again in May, you're going to see people coming and going. Um, I'm like I said, it's a, it's a, this thing is kind of in, it's in motion still. So up. What they've done up until this point right now, I'm satisfied. They're working in the right direction. And that's, we have to give them time to bring in the better talent to make the defensive scheme work better. Yeah, and you know, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, Lincoln Riley knows what we don't know because he's he's got all the inside information. He right. knows who's called him. Uh, who they've called you know it's a lot easier to have a letter of intent day where you throw out all these players in, on one one press release you go wow look at all these guys but this is a slow process you get this guy one week you get this guy another week and sometimes you fail to put them all together for a question like this i personally think on offense they've done a great job i'm really excited about lloyd by the way i think this guy's a real stud uh and it would not shock me if he ends up being I don't think he'll start maybe at the beginning of the season because I think they'll feel uh, a little bit of, uh, shall we say, hometown cooking with uh, Austin Jones, who I think is, you know, you give him a decent line. He's he's, he's very effective. Uh, but I look at, uh, you know, the front seven on defense. I, I think there may be a player or two quality transfer, and I think they could really do some great things if it matches up with Alex Grinch's scheme, and I can't emphasize the scheme enough, but I think, uh, like Mark said, uh, they're headed in the right direction, and we'll see what happens uh, at the end of the second uh, transfer window. Uh, my biggest con concern, uh, and I'm not going to get into this, but I'm more concerned about getting front seven type players out of high school. Me right too. Now, 
that that's that is a concern with me for continuity purposes yes, and yes, long yes. term that's that's my opinion of it uh let's uh stay on the transfer portal thing just for a minute we'll wrap this section up the ncaa has adjusted the rules for the ncaa transfer portal ncaa division one councils approved legislation to limit waivers for second time transfer players now any uh, undergraduates who are transferred for a second time or any time after that must uh, meet specific guidelines in order to be eligible for immediate playing time starting in 2023-2024 or risk sitting out a year between transfers. Under the new rule, players can still get immediate eligibility at their next school if they are transferring due to physical injury or mental health concerns. There is also an exigent circumstance clause that the NCAA will also consider exigent uh, circumstances like abuse or sexual assault, but will not consider academic or athletic reasons like being unhappy with playing time on their team for for a, a immediate uh, eligibility. Panel, your thoughts on this new NCAA transfer legislation, Bruce? What do you think? Well, I'm very ambivalent about the transfer portal for a lot of reasons. Uh, you mentioned continuity. I've always had a problem with that, uh, what this creates. Uh, it's like basketball, right? With what Kentucky, they had all those guys, they all came in one year, but they won the NCAA championship and then they all left. Uh, never mind the fact they were in college, at least theoretically. Uh, but um, frankly, I think this is an improvement, I guess. You don't want to have guys continually transferring. Uh, but I think it's a little bit laughable to think that they won't consider, they will not consider academic or athletic reasons like being unhappy with playing time on their team. Well, hell, that's why they all transfer, most of them. So I'm not really sure what this does at the end of the day. Uh, it seems a little bit absurd to me, uh, but I do like the idea of limiting the amount of movement that can go on, especially after a kid's already made one move. Mark, what do you think? Was this an improvement? Yes. Or is this just fixing a, a, a loophole here? No, this is an improvement. They, they, they should call this the JT Daniels rule. <laughs> uh, that's what this yeah. is about. This is really what it's about. You, you know, when they put in that little, you know, they, they can't transfer for lack of playing time or academics or whatever. That's what this is about. You can't have a quarterback saying, all right, well, I tried it here. Didn't like it. Let me go try it there. All right. Didn't like it. Let me go try it there. You got, like you said, Bruce, for continuity reasons, it's okay to say, all right, I made a mistake out of high school. I gave it a shot. In fact, I would even put in another guardrail. You can't transfer until you're, until you've completed your sophomore year. That you makes sense. It's okay to make a mistake. And you can find loopholes at, after that first year if you really need to transfer. But yeah, they, they need to kind of corral this because it's it's turned into too much free agency. The tail is wagging the dog right now. You have programs like Washington State and Oregon State, Arizona, they become feeder schools for USC. They become the minor leagues. They start developing them. And once these, you know, diamonds in the rough become Dorian Singer, Dorian Singer can now go to USC for a year and get more exposure before he goes to the NFL. I, you know, USC is the beneficiary of the transfer portal more times than not. But, you know, the question was, <laughs> I got to, I got to admit it's, you got to put some rules in place. Otherwise, you've got JT Daniels going to his, what, fourth school, fifth school? Keaton Slovis. He's at BYU now. I was just going to say Slovis, yeah. yeah. Enough. Yeah, I, I think that uh, anything that will close the loopholes on some of these things, and I think, uh, you know, the idea of waiting to your sophomore year, I mean, they do it anyway, right? For To go to the NFL, you got to play, you know, at least th get through your three, three years out of high school. Yeah, you know. So to me, they're 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 working towards trying to be more equitable. It will be a benefit, not just to the players, but it'll be a benefit to coaches who are beside themselves 
uh, with constantly trying to recruit player transfers with the portal, it's a mess. And, uh, you know, there's some other things we'll, we can go into in future shows, like the early signing period and so on and so forth. But I'm happy to see they're, they're, they're making some steps in trying to regulate uh, the transfer uh, portal. So, all right, it's overtime. Viewer questions, panel answers. Panel, it's halftime uh, in, in the sense that uh, we've moved on to the overtime period to answer some viewer questions. First question is from Bewick. Buick says, one of my great fears regarding Grinch is that he will have a mediocre defense, which will be an improvement and accepted as good enough because it, it's, it's an improvement. What are you or the wise men looking for as an acceptable defense? Jump right in. Who wants to start on this one? 50% improvement. 50% improvement. Not 5%, not 2 50%. That's what I'm looking for. You know, I, I think it's a win-win for everybody. By the end of the 2023, if USC's defense improves and it matches USC's offense that I anticipate is going to continue to trend in a positive direction, USC is going to be in, in a very good position to make the playoffs. If they don't, Lincoln Riley is going to have one more year of data of, of data points to reflect back on and not have to make an emotional decision about why or he's going to keep Alex Trench around for another year or not. It's like we talked about at the beginning of the show. This is all on Lincoln now. Let's just it's so what now what? Let's just move forward. Yeah, I think it's I think that's that's accurate. Um look all the quotes that he said in that media conference, they're going to be revisited without question, uh, depending on the results of this upcoming season, which will be more yep. challenging. And uh, improvement for me would be like yards per play that they gave up. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't even know if time of possession means anything anymore because we saw Tulane didn't have a lot of time of possession and look at the damage that they did. So, uh, I actually told Lincoln Riley that my favorite offensive series of the year was USC's first offensive series in the Cotton Bowl. Remember, Greg, we were talking, it was nine, almost nine minutes that they held on to the ball. Yeah, that was beautiful. Yeah. And that's the best way to help a beleaguered defense. And that's what kind of the connection I was making with Lincoln during that Q&A. Well, program. that's a good, that's a very good point. And that's old school football right there. Old school. All right, question two. Block. question two from Romy in Huntington Beach, California. Do you think Riley will influence Grinch in upgrading or changing his defensive package? It's kind of an interesting question. Uh, all right, throw your hat in the ring. I do, and I talked about it earlier in the show. I think he's taken a page from, you know, and Pete Carroll's not the only one to do this, but that happened back then. USC had a defense that kept getting better at the end of Pete's first year, but the offense kind of just went, you know, it's just flatlined. And I think that's what happened with USC's defense. It got worse. It didn't get better. It got worse. But you had a positive data point in there. They were creating turnovers. Lincoln knows that, hey, maybe if I have my offense run some longer drives or I encourage my defense coordinator, hey, you know what? Let's game plan with what we have, let's not try and take a square peg and put it into a round hole. Let's just make some tweaks and adjustments to what you're doing. Let's try it my way. Well, I don't have as much confidence in Lincoln Riley's uh, defensive uh, prowess that I had in with, uh, first of all. He can read he, a defense. He knows how to attack it. You would think he would know how to. Well, you would think so, but you know, in the last, uh, four or five years with Grinch, there's a different, there's a definite uh, pattern of behavior to use the term over and over and over again. And I'm not convinced that Riley is at the level of Pete Carroll, to be quite honest with you. Uh, I think that Riley is dealing with a coordinator who I think is uh, generally tries <laughs> really hard. I like a lot of the things that Grinch says, but it just doesn't seem to uh, show up on the field and has not been showing up on the field. Little increments of improvement. This team doesn't need little increments of defensive improvement. It needs big increments of improvement. 
And I don't know what Riley can tell him. Now, I will say this, if Riley wants to, which I don't think he'll do, adjust his philosophy on ball control uh, to help Grinch, I don't see that happening. I just cannot see that when you have a player as dynamic as uh, Caleb Williams, because, you know, part of part of SC's, should we say, uh, positive strategy is to make teams outscore them. And, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't do anything to take away from SC's strength uh, because I think you just create bigger weaknesses. So uh, I'm not real uh, confident on what Riley will do unless Riley says to him, I want to go to this scheme and this is what it's going to be. And here's the reasons for it. And Grant says, you're the boss. OK, that's what we'll do. Now, that's possible, but we'll see. What do you think, uh, Bruce? Uh, I, I, I'm i just dubious about it. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know all the dynamics between these two guys. I know they're, they're friends. They like each other. They've been together for a while. Um, it definitely requires a restructuring on a whole, you know, change of direction culturally and, and probably scheme wise. Um, I, you know, I, if, if, you know, if I were him, if I were Riley, I'd say, look, I want to see you, I want to see you blitz, blitz, uh, you know, get it going. Let's go. Let's be aggressive. Um, but you know, I don't know. I'm just hopeful with some of these new guys, maybe, maybe somehow, I don't even know what Grinch's system is to be honest with you. They don't tackle, you know what I mean? They play like a, what is it? Like a three four or is it a three three five is that what it is kind of a three three five three three five i mean i'd play a four three and you know and and get back to playing real football i i don't know i i'm dubious about it but i'm, I'm hopeful let me put it there. i'm just hopeful all right question three from richard and thousand oaks i saw that justin didich officially announced he is returning for another season uh as the offensive line as a center how important is Justin returning for another season at center? I personally think it's very important. It's a question of how good a center he can be now that he's back at his natural position. Uh, certainly he has enough experience, so he can he can give out line calls. But I, I see it as a real positive that he's returning, no doubt about it. And he's a leader. He's a leader of the offensive line. And the guys will respond to him. And uh, no, I think, I mean, we've got some young guys playing on the offensive. No, I think you need a real senior, you know, experienced anchor. And I, I think, I think Didich, and I think I like about Didich, he's waited his turn. You know, he didn't play much until last year, played guard. But before that, he was second, second stringer, but he's hung in there and he's, you know, and he's paid his dues. And I think he'll be a real plus. I think he'll, he, I think he'll really, motivate the offensive line and i think he's a very talented kid too no it's he is the the key to the offensive line in 2023 make no yeah. doubt about it yeah. you're put you're, you're going to be without Voorhees. You're, you know you're going to be without neilan um bobby hassens came in and, and i'll use the way term he made an impact but he's gone now too so you need justin didich as the anchor of that, of that offensive line and not just so much on the line, you need him in the locker room. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah, um, leadership. When they, when coaches talk about guys just doing things the right way, he, they're talking about the Justin Dieters of the world. You know, we, I can rehash for very momentarily what happened at the end of 2021 with that game against Cal, where there was literally a, a little mutiny going on. There were some players on that team that did not want to play the game that weren't even going to go out to practice. And this was after Lincoln Riley was already announced as head coach. It was Justin who went back into that locker room. And I don't know exactly what was said, but it, there were words. So, yeah, you need Justin Tietish. Um, Otherwise, Caleb Williams, he can, he can escape on his own. We watched him do it. But he's going to be, he's going to look, it, it, it wouldn't be a pretty picture without, without Justin. Let's just leave it there. All right, let's go to question four, a couple more, and then we're, we're done for, the, uh, for this yep. session. 
uh, from Craycraft in Fountain Valley, California. I saw we lost three quality receivers in C.J. Williams, Gary Bryant Jr., and Kyle Ford. I thought they were really good. Who did you see? Who do you see as the starters uh, going into spring ball? Uh, and I'm going to expand this question. How about fall as well? Who's got a, who's got thoughts on this? Who are the starters? I think right off the bat, you're going to put Taj Washington into the starter role. Uh, Lincoln Riley said at the at the at our state of the program address that he had that he thought Taj had the biggest growth of all of his receivers. Um, so he's I think he is etched his spot in there. I really think they want to keep forcing the ball to Brendan Rice. Um, after that, I don't know. Pick pick somebody. Well, I the guy that that I think they really underuse, and I think he may be as good as anybody, all the receivers, is Michael Jackson. He's a tremendous player, wonderful talent. And uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't find his way in there. But we've got to, you know, and, and, and then, then you've got this Dorian Singer coming in and Zachariah Branch, uh, Makai Lemon. I mean, there are a lot of talent. I mean, we made this point earlier. But we have no shortage of super talented receivers. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the three receivers probably going to be Taj Washington. I think Singer is going to end up starting. Uh, and I think Mario Williams will end up starting. But I think uh, how it starts may not be how it ends and injuries will change everything. But I do agree with Bruce. I think if he's healthy, uh, Michael Jackson, uh, the third, is really, really pretty good. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right, final question, guys, from Yasmin in Riverside, California. Who do you see as the best player ever from the Inland Empire? Uh, I'm going to throw out my card right now. Uh, you could think about Anthony Munoz from Chafee, Sammy Knight, okay? Sammy, yeah. Uh, Shelton Diggs uh, from San Bernardino High School was quite good, but I think, in my opinion, the best ever was Ronnie Lott from Eisenhower High School. That's just my opinion. How about it, guys? Who's the best? I'm not going to argue. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. I was just going to throw that out. Was the that was I saw him play as a freshman. Um, R.J. Soward, who knows how good he could have been. Yeah. Uh, his freshman year against UCLA was freaking amazing. But yeah. Ronnie Lott, there was no. You don't need to pull any other name. By the way, we had a great uh, interview. Arledge had a great interview with Sammy. Uh, and I thought it was a really wonderful interview. And it, uh, Sammy uh, is not only, I mean, the guy played 11 years in the NFL at, the, at a super high impact position, strong safety. And, and despite that, he is so lucid and, and smart and articulate. And somebody would really be proud of it. I think, you know, he, what was he, an undrafted free agent? Yep. He ends up making all pro. He plays in the league for years. He was a great, but Ronnie, you know, you could make the argument Ronnie's the greatest safety who ever played in the NFL, uh, or certainly one of the top two or three. Um, I think we've got, we've got an argument for a couple of our other guys there, uh, like Troy, for example, uh, and, and, and certainly, uh, uh, a couple other guys, but uh, I don't. Ronnie's Ronnie's tough to beat, though. Ronnie's tough to beat. Well, I'll tell you what. Excellent uh, responses to the questions. I uh, hope uh, everyone enjoyed listening to the responses. You might have your own opinions on uh, the best player out of the Inland Empire. Uh, but if you have a comment or a question that you'd like to address to our panel, go either to the WeRSC message boards. Click on the thread that pertains to Inside the Trojans Huddle, viewer or listener questions. That's going to do it for us for this Tuesday's edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle. So until next Tuesday, a big thank you to our panelists, Mark Culkin and Bruce Bagney, and a special big thank you to all of you for watching or listening to Inside the Trojans Huddle. Have yourself a great week. This is your moderator, Greg Katz, wishing you all and saying to you, fight on, everybody.